You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Diane Payne. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a fantastic show for you today. But before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about a couple of sponsors who make the show possible each and every day. Craig Allenson has a brand new book. It's a spinoff of the Expeditionary Force uh, series, Expeditionary Force Mavericks, book one, Death Trap. The human soldiers stranded on the planet Paradise have been recruited into an alien legion to do the dirty jobs that the high-tech species won't do. Their first mission is to kick the enemy off a backwater planet no one cares about. It's a simple assignment, except everyone has a hidden agenda, and the planet could become a death trap. Craig Allenson's brand new book, Death Trap. Also thanks to Ernie Lindsay with his Sarah series, the psychological thriller series that begins with Sarah has books one through three and a bonus novella, single mother, successful executive, target for revenge. The psychological thriller series box set Sarah Winthrop's world is thrown headlong into a whirlwind of chaos along with her family, friends, and colleagues by unseen enemies seeking revenge. Those lurking in the shadows clawing for vengeance will go to any lengths. Any lengths. It's likely never occurred to them that they may have just messed with the wrong woman. The Sarah series. Books 1-3 through in a bonus novella by Ernie Lindsay. Also, John L. Monk with the Jenkins Cycle. From book one, Kick, a supernatural thriller. They say suicides are damned for eternity, but if possessing the bodies of violent criminals is hell, then Dan Jenkins will take it, and he does, every time a portal arrives to whisk him from his ghostly exile. Normally, before the villain returns to kick him out, Dan dishes out a final serving of justice and leaves the world a safer place. It's one of the rules if he wants more rides, and he's happy to oblige. For a part-time dead guy, it's a pretty good gig. And then he meets her. Kick is the first book in a series of supernatural thrillers. If you like Quantum Leap and Every Day, you'll love this gritty and original take on the body-hopping hero story. Vividly written, Kick is a wild ride with a sharp, sarcastic wit and a flawed yet likable main character. From John L. Monk, The Jenkins Cycle, book one, Kick. And from M.D. Massey, Invasion, Zombie Apocalypse. The action-packed first novel in M.D. Massey's Them, Zombie Apocalypse series. When a surprise nuclear attack forces Aiden from hiding, he finds the world to be a much different place and more deadly. Now he'll traverse a post-apocalyptic landscape populated by violent redneck looters, rogue military factions, and an army of hungry undead. After two combat tours in the Middle East, Aiden Sullivan just wants to be left alone on his family's ranch in the Texas Hill Country. But when the bombs fall and the dead walk, Aiden risks life and limb to rescue his aging parents from the zombie horde. To save them, he'll traverse half the state of Texas while fighting rogue military units, violent redneck looters, and thousands of walking dead. The question is, can he make it there in time? Only one thing's for sure, this ranger will complete the mission or he'll die trying. M.D. Massey's Invasion Zombie Apocalypse. Now on to our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Diane McPhail on the show with me today. Today is the release day for her debut novel. It's called The Abolitionist Daughter, and this is an amazing book that I think you guys are really going to love. This is a story very close to my heart, very close to my home, and I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, welcome to the show, Miss Diane. Thank you so much, Hank. I'm just delighted to be here and talk about this, especially on the day that the book is released. I know, I know. It's uh, uh, so. Congratulations on that. I know this has been uh, a 
a, a book that's been uh, long in the making, and uh, we're going to talk all about that in just a minute. But before we do, uh, we open each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, I've listened to your uh, various uh, sessions, and I knew you were going to ask that. And I've I've been thinking about it, and it's it's almost something that I don't know how to answer. Um, as a child, I was in love with the library. We walked to the library every day from the time I was old enough to walk, three years old, and had books and had books and had books and my home had books and my grandparents' home had books and they were wonderful older books that had the woodcuts in them and beautiful old bindings and I was just in love with reading and and with literature. Um, it, it offered me a kind of... Um, alternative reality that was that was very seductive for me um it just took me out of my ordinary life um but for writing i i really i i wrote assignments i wrote academics um and as i was growing up um we had a few teachers who might have us write a little poetry but we didn't really have creative writing. And um, in college, I was um, part of the, the literary journal and the, the, um, the, uh, the yearbook and various things. But it, it was more essay, um, just not, not really fiction, not really storytelling. Um, and then I became an artist, and my my paintings were my way of telling a story. And somewhere in my, um, I don't exactly know how old I was, but I think my children were up enough to be independent. I went to um, a workshop with Madeline Lingle. That wonderful, amazing woman, uh, a wrinkle in time, and an amazing teacher. And she gave us this exercise that was um, her name, his name, he said, she said, and a place. And uh, the ones that I got were so prosaic, I thought, Oh, my word, this is just, what am I going to do with this? This is going to be utterly boring. And, and of course, Madeline's premise on any kind of creativity is that the work knows more than you do. And it just comes to you, and you are its birther and its servant. So I went out and sat on the lawn with my paper and pen and my names and she said, he said. And I put my pen to the paper and I wrote, Elizabeth was at least as old as Eleanor, or so she always protested. And I thought, oh my word, where did that come from? story emerged that I, I could never have just made up out of my head. It just, this story just began to birth itself. And, and the experience was the same kind of experience that I had when I was reading. It was this revelatory kind of experience. And that's how I began writing. I love it. That is uh, that is amazing. Um, where where did you grow up? I grew up in what's called the Mississippi Delta, uh, just south of Memphis, um, and about ten miles off the river. 
uh, it's it's not a true geographical delta. It's really the alluvial floodplain of right. of uh, the river that runs from Memphis to Vicksburg. Um, so I grew up in that flat, flat uh, cotton country. Yeah, um, there's uh, there's something unique about growing up in Mississippi that's uh, uh, you, you can't quite put your finger on, but it's it's a uh, it's another world uh, in a lot of ways, and in a lot of ways, it's not much different from from the rest of the world. Uh, but it's a it's a unique place, uh, to say the least. Uh, what what is it about Mississippi that still sticks with you today? The land and the sky. Uh, I lived. Where the horizon went 360 degrees and the sky was that big. And there was nothing to interrupt it except the rows of trees at the end of uh, the turn rows in the, in the cotton fields. Um, and, and it felt so big that it embraced you. So it was something about the land that just held you. Um, and there was also something about the culture in that everybody knew everybody. Uh, across the board, everybody knew everybody. And that extended from town to town and from um, area of Mississippi to other areas of Mississippi. I think it was more true of the Delta per se, um, but we we just had friends all over the state and went went to visit and just go have lunch or something. I mean, we go we drive sixty miles to get a piece of pie. <laughs> well, it's easy to do in the Delta. That's that's yeah. for sure. Uh, I live on the opposite side of the state and in uh, more of the the tree and hill country uh, of of the state, but you know the the people are the same. Um, you know, in the community I grew up in, everybody knew everybody. Um, I, you know, to the point that uh, the the school that uh, that my kids go to, uh, I I grew up with a lot of the people that are now teachers and uh, the parents of other kids, and uh, there's there's definitely a strong community uh, feel that uh, that I'm sure happens you know, all over the place, but it, it just seems to be a very Southern thing, if not Mississippi thing. Well, I hear that a lot. What part of Mississippi are you in? Uh, we are around Meridian on the, on the East Central side. Oh my goodness. The first year of our marriage, we lived in Newton. Okay. Yeah. I have, <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of nephews and nieces that uh, go to school there. Really? That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I taught, I taught freshman composition in Decatur at um, the community college. At East Central. How about that? I did. Wow. Small, small world. Small world. It is. Um, Do you you still live in Mississippi now? No, I live in North Carolina. That's what I thought. I live in the mountains now. I live on a – I live in an old grist mill. Oh, nice. Uh, that had been abandoned for 30 years when I found it. And we have this huge waterfall that was, uh, has a flume that siphoned off to, to run these big 15, 18 foot, uh, water wheels and gears and so forth. And, um, I, my husband said, Oh, this is just wonderful location. We can, tear this thing down and build a house. I said, no, no, we, no. <laughs> we, we spent about two years and actually kept, I still have all the machines, I'm six years and all the machinery primary that, that I kept right here in, in my office. It's where I work. After that, uh, that workshop with Madeline Langle, um, what, uh, What did you write after that? Well, I joined a writing, a local writing group um, up here. 
And the first hour, we would give each other prompts. We would just throw out a, a word. And I loved that kind of writing. And I found that almost everything, almost every prompt led me toward this story that I grew up with. Uh, my, my parents' people were from Webster County, uh, up around Eupora in the hill country. And, and there was this story that I, that I grew up with, and I found that most of these prompts led me to something that had to do with that. So um, this this book, The Abolitionist Daughter, uh, has been um, in the making for for your whole life, really. As you talked about this this story that was handed down to you, can can you tell us the 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 personal story from that was handed down to you in your childhood that that was the the story that informed this book? Yes, I'd be delighted. Um, the people from book, as we talked about this community kind of feel, the people from Webster County uh, described themselves as being from Webster County, not from, I mean, and then they would add from this community or this little town, but it was, well, I'm from Webster County. Um, and there was this story out of history about what they called the feud. And I, and I can, uh, the town was Greensboro, which had been a thriving major town back when Webster County was actually part of Choctaw County, which was a huge uh, land, piece of land that encompasses three or four counties now. Uh, but it was, acquired by the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek um, from from the Choctaw, and it was called Choctaw County, and Greensboro was the county seat. And when I was a child, I can remember people telling stories about bloody Greensboro and the feud. And I remember my, I must have been maybe five years old, my aunt taking me to what she described it, she was going to take me to the ghost town. Well, in my mind, you know, I'm envisioning the ghost town the way it's depicted in the Western movies of the time, you know, with the empty storefronts and uh, tumbleweed blowing through the, a dirt street. Well, we, we get there, and there's no town. There, there's no buildings. There's no tumbleweed. There's only this overgrown, abandoned cemetery. And I can feel right this minute the utter puzzlement and disappointment. Like, where is the ghost town? So th there literally is nothing that has survived of that thriving town except this cemetery. And all these bloody stories, and there are many of them, but the primary one that they call the feud was these two families who had intermarried, brothers and sisters to brothers and sisters, and uh, there was an inheritance dispute, and it uh, escalated into murder and um mayhem and multiple murder and uh, a whole mob violence outbreak in the town and breaking into the jail and shootings in the jail and ultimately um, the lynching of the town doctor. Um, so it was quite a story and over time it had taken on as stories do, the kind of um, legendary, stereotypical qualities that appear in oral tradition. 
So you have the good guys and the bad guys and the good people and the not good people. Um, that's, but the story had sort of always haunted me. And um, I was, my mother died after I was born. I was about nine weeks old. So I really never knew her. And in my middle adulthood, I, I felt this deep yearning to know who my mother had been. And so I was trying to find everything. I, I got an old scrapbook and um, some postcards and various things. And the only person who was still alive who had known her was my uncle, who still lived on the old home place. And I went to see him. And uh, I'm, this is a sideline right here. Most books, you read, you read the blurb and it says, oh, this happened and this happened. And then they go and they find these family secrets. And that's how the book evolves. Well, my book evolved because I discovered a family secret. I'm visiting my uncle. He's telling me charming little stories about their childhood and how they played and how he rode his tricycle up to be the mailman when they would, you know, have a little, make a little house and kitchen and so forth. And I'm looking at this album of old photos and I turn the page and here is an old newspaper article about the feud and bloody Greensboro. And I took a deep breath and I said, you know, Ralph, because I, I was a therapist at this time. I said, you know, Ralph, this story really bothers me. It's always bothered me. But I don't understand this story. I don't understand the motivation to this kind of violence. I don't understand how the these women who survived this lived with their trauma and went on with their lives. And he sat back on the floor and looked at me and he said, Diane, you don't know who that woman was? And I said, which one? He said, that young woman, that young wife who buried her father, her brothers, her husband, his brothers, all in one day. And I said, well, no, Ralph, I have no idea. He said, that was my grandmother. That was your mother's grandmother. So, that was quite a shock to me. And um, I realized I had been writing about it. Uh, without knowing anything. And now I had to really begin to find out and do the research and discover what this had all been about. Primarily the motivation to the violence and the recovery from trauma. You you mentioned earlier that um, as, as historical incidents... Um, go down to history and become legend uh, that things tend to um, devolve into their uh, stereotypical uh, means and and you know, stories are kind of born that way in, in legends and uh, and I paraphrase what you said but um, how how did how did this story start um, uh, well first um, what were some of the um, the stereotypes that 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 the story became, and then how do you start uncovering that to get to um, uh, w what is the real truth of it? And I know the book that you wrote, The Abolitionist Daughter, is a novel, but it's heavily influenced by by these um, uh, real happenings. So how do you how do you start peeling back the layers to get to what really happened? Well, the truth of the matter is, Hank, I don't know what really happened. I can only surmise, and that's why my book is fiction. 
and and I really do emphasize it is fiction. Um, and first of all, this was not a feud. It it was an incident that became mass community mob violence, multiple deaths, and it all occurred within about 24 hours. Um, so it, it wasn't spread out over years, and you know, two families fighting each other. Um, so, so that's one stereotype, just right in, at the core of things. Um, and the other is just beginning the research. For example, um, I had no idea that the judge, who is the abolitionist, I had no idea that he had almost lost his judgeship trying to free his slaves. And then why could he not free his slaves? And I think this is not very well known. Uh, we know that earlier in the era of slavery that people could buy their own freedom. Um, the owners could will them their freedom. Uh, they could just grant them their freedom. But in all the compromise and conflict leading up to the Civil War, after the early 1850s, um, with the slave state, free state um, controversies, one of the one of the compromises that was made was that manumission, freeing your slaves, was illegal. You could not do it. Uh, I had no idea that you couldn't free your slaves. I know. It's amazing, isn't it? Diane, in, um, in, in kind of peeling back the layers of, uh, of a story like this, um, how do you, and you said this is definitely a novel, this is your your telling of a of a story similar to that. Um, how did the characters start revealing themselves to you, and uh, and and how do you how do you go about taking an historical event and uh, and bringing it to life? Well, first of all, I I created my own characters uh, who are evolved or that's not the right word, who, whose seed is, whose origin is in that actual history. Um, but I, I simplified the number of people involved. It was too much for the reader. Um, and I began to look at it from the standpoint of my experience as a therapist. That's, that's where I began with, from my own inner standpoint, is how, how, what leads to that kind of uh, extreme conflict where you would, you would kill someone. And, and the first thing that I knew is that this good guy, bad guy was not realistic. That's, that's not how people are. People are multi, multi, multi-dimensional. And the best of us have questionable qualities. And the worst of us have some admirable qualities. And so I began to look at these characters and think, well, these people have a full range of human emotion, of human motivation, of human reaction, um, and their relationships to one another. And I, I, I questioned this whole idea of the, the good family and the bad family, because it was attributed just to land greed. They were, they, this was just all about land greed. Well, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that, um, because 
you have if if it had been um one couple where oh these two fall in madly in love and they run off and get married that happens you can buy that but when you've got a second brother and sister who who are married in in these two families um that changes things that means that somehow these families were accepting of each other that there was approval here of these two unions so that that takes those families right out of the stereotype immediately um the other thing that i i question was the that this was the town doctor who was married to the judge's daughter so he was he was had to be an educated man um the judge had to have approved this union um the other thing is that that the other sister who was married to the judge's son had been to boarding school with the judge's daughter so again you have these hints at equality and and in my research i discovered a story that had not been told in this legendary uh mythological sequence that has come down and that was the origin of any inheritance conflict and that was the death of the oldest son um who's married to the doctor's sister and I, i know i'm getting a little confusing about these characters but i don't quite know how else to describe this um this eldest son had suddenly become ill and the doctor his brother-in-law was treating him and the judge was so unhappy with the treatment that he called in a doctor from another town who in the consultation said that if the treatment was continued this this son would die and the treatment was continued by the son-in-law and the son did die so suddenly you have this incredibly somewhat mysterious complication that serves as some kind of seed core for what could come as inheritance conflict so um you've got this mystery how what what caused this man to die uh what was the treatment mm, how did this all play out in the family so it it's my fictionalization of that and what the outcomes of that might be Diane when you're dealing with a a time and a place like this um and you know the The sad thing about history is the farther away that we get from an historical event, the more it gets uh kind of boiled down to uh to bullet points and we lose all of the nuance and all of the context to historical events. Um and it's 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 very easy to look back um on a on a very difficult time uh and and think that you know everything that there is to know about the people involved and uh and you lose all of all of the nuance of people and like you said earlier there are very few people that are pure evil there are very few people that are that are purely good we, we all have conflicting motivations and um people are are weird and complex and yeah, uh, yeah. you yeah. know it's it's just the truth of it um what what do you what did you find out uh that that surprised you maybe uh about this time period this place these events uh these people uh and what do you think readers might be surprised to know 
uh, you know, because uh, you just assume that everything's evil, um, you know, then. And and hopefully we've come to a better place now. Um, but it's just not I, always that easy. I wish. We have made progress, but we are not there, you know. Um, I think what surprised me, Hank, was discovering that this man had tried to, to free his slaves. It was also illegal to educate them. It was illegal to marry them. But he being a judge, he could he could marry them. He could illegally, legally marry them. Um, what a conundrum. And, and he conspired with his children's tutor to set up a secret slave school to educate them for um, the freedom that he believed was inevitable. Uh, and that even without the freedom that they deserved, that they they deserved to have this opportunity and to be educated. Um, so I found this whole edge of um, Southern anti-slavery. I think another of the larger stereotypes uh, that we live with culturally is that um, the whole South was, as you say, evil, uh, engaged in slavery. And, um, and there were people who opposed it. And there were even people, I mean, the irony is that here we have a slave-owning Southern abolitionist. Right. Yeah. He, Which he, is... Yeah, which is a conundrum of conundrums. Conundrum of conundrums. Uh, and in in addition to educating them, to marrying them, keeping them in families, he he worked hard to keep families together. And he acquired, he inherited his slaves. He, but the ones he bought, he did buy slaves. He he bought to to rescue from worse situations. Or to keep families together, um, and that impulse, which in my novel is shared by his daughter Emily, that is the originating point at which um, the entire plot begins to open. Um, Emily sees um, an auction notice for the sale of a slave whom she knows has a family. And she begs her father to do what he can to keep them together. And this is one of the themes that I think is really important and is deeply embedded in the whole novel, is how often, well, not often, but sometimes, uh, unexpectedly, our very best intentions can have unforeseen consequences that can be truly terrible. And so that's how the plot begins to open out, to ripple out, is from that one really well-intentioned purpose. And we know about uh, about good intentions and... <laughs> what what our mothers told us about that. Um, the the abolitionist daughter uh, is a fascinating read. Um, I've had the book for I don't know a, a month or so, maybe maybe a little bit longer, and it is uh, it's it, it reads like someone's diaries. It's uh it, you you really done an exceptional job of of uncovering these characters and making them feel like people that we that we know or people that we've we've heard stories about from from our relatives uh it it really reads that way um uh, diane when people finish the book and they've closed the back cover what do you hope that they're left with i hope that they're left with compassion and curiosity Two uh, two things that we should seek more of. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book is out everywhere today. Um, the Abolitionist Daughter, uh, Diane. If people are uh, are just learning about you and want to learn more about uh, everything that 
that you do? Is there a place that they can connect with you online? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm on Facebook as Diane McPhail. And my author uh, website is com. Excellent. We're going to send everybody to see you, and uh, we'll have links to the show, uh, to the book in the show notes. Uh, Diane, it's been so much fun talking with you. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. I'm melting! I'm melting! cried Joey. Take the picture already! He stood with one arm around the bronze waist of the bewitched tribute statue, Samantha Stevens, riding a broom across a crescent moon. Jason tried in vain to frame the shot without any tourists in it, but that was impossible. From all points of the compass, a merry horde had arrived for Salem's two-day summer psychic fair. All the commuter trains had burst open, like cornucopias filled beyond capacity, spilling endless fruits and nuts onto the red brick sidewalks of Essex Street. A vampiress in lavender shorts and feathered boots sold maple chocolate walnut fudge in front of the Witch City Tattoo Parlor. A near-naked gypsy in purple-green veils danced with a pheasant in her arms around a plug-in Hanukkah menorah. A fat man in a fetching blue jeans dress sold amethyst and citrine charm bracelets in front of Medusa Cafe, but his stand got knocked over by a one-armed crone driving a mobility scooter who sang, Choo-choo! as she passed, her stump on the wheel, her lipstick ghastly, her gnarled right hand raised in trailing plumes of noxious cigarette smoke. Chewbacca leapt out of her way and slapped sparks from his fur. He gave a disgruntled growl before going back to playing summer lovin' on his ukulele. The old one-armed dervish drove off, choo-choo, parting a crowd of wanderers, slack-jawed tourists with camera straps tight across their bellies, yellow-vested police on segways, elderly rollerbladers, face-painted infants and harried parents, and college girls. So many hot, hysterical college girls that you'd think somebody had napalmed a sorority house. Jason, are you deaf? Sorry. Jason raised the phone and took the shot. Joey inspected the photo and nodded in approval. Your turn. No, thanks. Do it, Shaggy. Don't make me hex you. Jason gave in and traded places. He put an arm around Samantha's metal back. Her bronze body had flushed in the afternoon sun, warm through his glove, but her eyes were weary. No, downright creepy and her smile was forced, like a Disneyland princess who'd had her toe stomped. Say chowder, cried Joey, who'd been practicing his New England accent all morning. Come on, man, say chowder. Fine, chowder. Joey got the shot, and Jason surrendered Samantha to a chubby kid wearing a Gandalf beard who climbed up to worship her bronze bosom. <laughs> 